Oh, yeah. Welcome to Wrestling Uncensored. I am Dave Simon. He is Johnny North. We are here with you every week talking professional wrestling. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on the radio. We're on iTunes. We're on Google Play. We're all over the place. If you're watching this on YouTube, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to subscribe and also click the bell so you get notifications every time we're on. We will be on during Money in the Bank. As soon as Money in the Bank starts, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Sunday night, we will be there. I will be there. Johnny will be there. We'll be in effect. My brother will be there as well. The whole pro wrestling watch along crew will be there watching WWE Money in the Bank with you on a Sunday night. I know it's tough times. You can't get together with your buddies to watch Money in the Bank to watch the UFC. Well, get together with us instead. Watch the UFC 249 show with us. A jam-packed extra special extra long ufc 249 watch along and of course the wwe money in the bank watch along as well right here on this channel right here this is wrestling uncensored and we're going to preview wwe's money in the bank we'll also recap what happened on aew dynamite and get you set for the next episode of dynamite we had the debut of Matt Hardy in AEW, a surprising debut that we'll talk about in a little bit. We'll also tell you about the AEW championship match that is official for Double or Nothing coming up in just, what, uh, two more weeks? Double or Nothing. We've only got uh, two more episodes of Dynamite before the next big AEW pay-per-view. Of course, it's not going to be taking place in Chicago, Illinois, looking more and more likely that it'll be in Jacksonville, Florida, the home of all sports, UFC, AEW, all in Jacksonville. WWE, of course, doing stuff at the Performance Center and and at their headquarters. This match is official. Well, it's two matches in one. Hard to preview this match. I've really had a hard time trying to figure out what this match is or will be as... It is going to be two matches happening at the same time. The women's Money in the Bank ladder match, as well as the men's, taking place simultaneously. I don't know how many referees they will have. I don't know if the bell will ring once or twice for the two separate matches. Will it count as one match or will it count as two? There are two briefcases on the line. This will be done at the WWE headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut, or, I mean, has already been done. We will see it. It's been recorded already. But this will be done at the Stamford headquarters of WWE, starting at the ground floor, making their way up to the top floor, where there will be a ring and ladders and briefcases suspended on something. I'm not really sure what those briefcases are suspended on because if you're on the roof... Usually above the roof, there's nothing. So the briefcases are hanging from the moon, I guess. I don't really know. But the briefcases will be suspended above the ring on some sort of structure. Maybe like an Ultimate X type of thing. I don't know. Let's try and figure out who's going to win this thing. Last week, we told you that we thought Jinder Mahal was going to win the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Because we thought Jinder Mahal was going to find himself in the last chance gauntlet match. And thankfully, we are wrong. We are dead wrong because Jinder Mahal, I don't even think he was in that last chance gauntlet match, right? He wasn't even, was he on Raw? He made his triumphant return to Raw two weeks ago, and everybody thought, oh, here we go. Here comes Jinder. He's going to feud with his ex-3MB teammate, Drew McIntyre, who's now the WWE champion. Of course, Jinder Mahal, a former WWE champion. It just made sense, but it's not happening because Jinder Mahal, not on Raw, not in the last chance gauntlet match. It started off with Roberto Lashley. And yes, that is his real name, Roberto. He beat Titus O'Neil, which obviously, why was Titus on Raw? Come on. And then Bobby beat Akira Tozawa, the power of Tozawa. Not very powerful. Bobby smashed him. Then Bobby beat Shelton Benjamin. I was like, oh, Shelton Benjamin. And you know what was crazy about the Shelton Benjamin matches? He looked roughly the same size as Bobby Lashley. 
man, Shelton Benjamin is one of these guys. Big. Okay, he's not as thick, but he's as tall as Lashley, and he's pretty thick, and he is a great wrestler. He's been in the business for a very long time. When I saw Shelton Benjamin on Raw, I thought two things. A, my goodness, he's big. I didn't realize he was that big. And B, wasn't he on SmackDown? Yeah, I believe he got traded to Raw because there was two drafts last year. There yeah. was one mid-year, and then in October, they had another draft. So I think in the second draft, he went to Raw. Well, Shelton was on Raw. He wrestled Lashley, and he lost, which we kind of expected, although I was kind of hoping for a Shelton victory. Bobby had already defeated Titus and Akira. I thought, oh, maybe Shelton, but no. Bobby beat Shelton. It was strange to see Shelton on TV. And then Umberto Carrillo shows up and beats Bobby Lashley by disqualification when Bobby wouldn't stack, stop attacking Umberto in the corner. During their match, the referee said, hey, Bobby, stop attacking him in the corner. You're not allowed to do that. You're holding on to the ropes. He's in the ropes. He's in the corner. You got to stop. One, two, three, four, five. Bobby didn't break the count. Bobby kept going. And, uh, yeah, that's all she wrote. Disqualification win there for Umberto Carrillo. What did you think of the uh, finish there in that match? Kind of weak way to get rid of Bobby Lashley. I didn't like the DQ finish. If you're going to get DQ'd, get DQ'd. But I never like the, uh, oh, I'm beating the guy up in the corner and I won't stop, so the referee has to stop the match. I never like that. It never makes the the winner of the match look good. It makes him look super weak. At least if you're getting hit with something illegal, like a low blow or a chair or whatever, then it doesn't make you look bad. It just makes the guy doing it look like he's just really, uh, you know, mean and maybe wants to stop you because you're too powerful for him. You know, Umberto's got a good move on Bobby, so he hits him with a low blow type of thing. He's got Bobby on the rope, so Bobby has to cheat to get out of a bad situation. But the attacking in the corner just makes Bobby look crazed for some reason, and it doesn't make Umberto look very good. And then he goes on and beats Angel Garza and Austin Theory. So... Doesn't make them look very good, yeah. very good either, right? You know what I'm saying, John? I, I get what you're talking about, but the match wasn't over there. Like AJ Styles came out at the end too, as well. So it, it kept going. If that was the finish, I would have been upset. But the fact that the ref disqualified him there, it, it kind of made sense because they don't usually call stuff like that. So it's better they actually reinforce the rules. I mean, it sucks that they reinforce the rules in that case because I found the gauntlet started to die a bit once Lashley was eliminated because Carrillo. Like, he just got killed pretty much next, like, two matches. It wasn't very exciting. Yeah, it was kind of fun when Bobby was in there. But as soon as Umberto came in, eh. You know, he wrestled Angel Garza. He was losing the match to Garza, and then he rolled him up with a quick win there. Kind of same deal with Austin Theory. Same type of match. It felt like a continuation of the last match. You know, the junior Andrade's there wrestling Umberto. And then finally, after Umberto beats Austin Theory and Angel Garza, here comes a phenomenal one, AJ Styles. He's back from the dead. He was buried alive, but you can't kill what is phenomenal. AJ Styles makes Umberto tap to the calf crusher to win the last, last chance gauntlet match and qualify for money in the bank. So we thought it would be Jinder as the final participant, but here's AJ Styles taking the spot of uh, Apollo Crews. Not a bad replacement here for Apollo Crews. I'm happy with this match. I'm happy with AJ Styles being in it. As you can tell, I'm wearing my P1 Phenomenal 1 AJ Styles shirt here on the show. I'm hyped to see AJ Styles in Money in the Bank. I was very excited to see him back on Raw. I thought the promo was great. AJ's like, I'm not a zombie. I'm not a ghost. There's no Undertaker to steal my spotlight now. I'm back. You know, talking about being buried alive. Says, I'm not a zombie or a ghost. I thought that was fantastic. He's like, yeah, I got buried. So what? Doesn't mean I lost. What are the rules to a boneyard match anyways? There are no rules to a boneyard match. Who says I lost that match? I thought that was really good stuff there from AJ Styles. And then he says uh, he's going to do anything to get the money in the bank contract, including uh, throwing Rey Mysterio or Aleister Black off the top of WWE headquarters. So he's threatening to kill people. 
after he's come back from the dead himself, buried alive by The Undertaker. Also says he didn't lose the Boneyard match, despite the fact that he was buried alive. And then I think a bell rang, and Undertaker's music hit, and he drove away on the motorcycle. But AJ says he didn't lose, which I thought was great. Great stuff from AJ. Thought the promo was great. Great surprise return from the Phenomenal One. I was very happy to see him. He's one of the top stars on Raw. We've been talking about over the past few weeks how we haven't seen the big stars on Monday Night Raw. Here comes one of the top guys in the business, AJ Styles. And now he's in this Money in the Bank ladder match versus Rey Mysterio, Daniel Bryan, Aleister Black, Otis, and uh, King Corbin. But, man, that's a pretty good Money in the Bank ladder match. If this was a traditional Money in the Bank ladder match, I would be very hyped because it would be really good. A six-man ladder match featuring AJ Styles, Daniel Bryan, and Rey Mysterio? Stop there. You know, the other guys are pretty good too. Aleister Black, Otis, King Corbin. I was not super impressed with Otis this week, but that's another story. We'll get to that. But Daniel Bryan, Rey Mysterio, and AJ Styles in one match? It's hard for that to be bad, right? It's hard to make a match bad when you have three of the greatest wrestlers of all time in it. When Brian, Rey Mysterio, and AJ Styles are all in one match, it's hard to make that bad. However, uh, Dana Brooke is also in that match, right? Because it's uh, all happening at the same time. So Daniel Bryan is not only going to have to carry King Corbin and Otis, but Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, and Rey Mysterio are also going to have to carry, in their own way, you know, Carmella and Dana Brooke and Nia Jax and Lacey Evans. So, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to turn out because it's not going to be in the ring. I mean, some of it will be in the ring. The finish will be in the ring. But a lot of it is going to be brawling around the WWE headquarters, fighting around the building and the offices and the gym and whatever. So I don't know how good that's going to be. It could be god-awful. It could be great. It's hard to predict. I, I look forward to it. I want to see what it's going to be. And with all that talent in those matches, you know, Asuka's there. Shayna Baszler's there. Daniel Bryan and Rey Mysterio and AJ Styles are there. There's some talent there. This could be good. I don't know. I'm 50-50, John. What are you thinking? I'm thinking it's going to be bad. Like, I feel in my gut that, I don't know, it's just too much, man. It's 12 people, six men, six women. They're around the building. It's a cinematic match. It has to finish on the roof somehow. They have to have a big finish. I feel like it's going to be bad. It's going to be hokey. It's going to be over the top. It's not going to make a lot of sense from a wrestling point of view, from a traditional pro wrestling point of view. It's going to be weird. It's going to be a, a cluster mess, right? Total mess. So I feel like it's going to be rough. Do you feel like it's going to be good, John? What's your, what's your gut feeling on this? I hope they prove me wrong. I'm hoping for the best, but I am prepared for the worst. Well, I understand that, given what we saw with that last fan standing with uh, Edge and Randy Orton, which was pretty much just a brawl around the performance center that just dragged on for way too long, so... There's fear or something like that could happen here. However, I, I just find if you put a lot of top talent in one match, odds are in your favor that I think it'll be a better match than a bad match. Well, I hope you're right, Big Johnny. I really hope that you're right. There is a lot of talent there. Let's get to it. Let's get to a prediction here. Daniel Bryan, Rey Mysterio, Aleister Black, King Corbin, Otis, and AJ Styles. The men's money in the bank ladder match. You know what? Forget it. Let's start with the women because I think the women's match is going to be a predictor of what the men, what will happen in the men's match, okay? And I'll tell you why. Because Shayna's going to win the women's match, okay? Shayna is for sure winning the women's match. Shayna or maybe, well, maybe Nia or maybe Asuka. I don't know. I just said Shayna for sure and now I'm rethinking it because it's going to be somebody from Raw, right? Shayna would make a lot of sense. She dominated the Elimination Chamber. It would make sense for her to be the winner of the Money in the Bank because 
WWE already is advertising Becky Lynch will be on Raw, will be making her triumphant return to Raw, and will be confronting the women's Money in the Bank winner. What does that tell you? Doesn't that tell you that somebody from Raw is winning? It seems a little obvious. If Becky Lynch, the Raw women's champion, is going to confront the Money in the Bank winner on Raw, you kind of figure it's going to be a Raw wrestler that's going to win this thing. And there are three Raw wrestlers in this. And I thought Shayna, she's got the history with Becky. It would make sense. She couldn't beat Becky clean at WrestleMania. So if she wins the Money in the Bank ladder match, she can get a cheap victory on Becky, attack her from behind, attack Becky after one of her matches, cash in Money in the Bank, and become champion that way. She couldn't beat her fair and square, so with the money in the bank, she can get it done. But you could do the same thing with Asuka. You could do the same thing with Nia Jax. Nia and Asuka are both heels. They've been building Nia pretty strong on Raw. I could see them giving it to Nia. I could see them giving it to Asuka. But I would say that the odds-on favorite is Shayna. And I would say that there's no chance in hell that Dana Brooke, Lacey Evans, or Carmella walk away with that briefcase. Am I wrong? Well, it does seem like it's favoring Raw because of what you said. Becky's going to confront the winner of this match. However, maybe that's just the swerve, too, where it's going to be she'll confront them, but it'll be like via the video satellite thing, and that's it. And maybe it will be someone from SmackDown. If someone from SmackDown would win, though, I think it would be Lacey Evans. Though I'm thinking Shayna overall. I've been thinking that since the start. Though you also throw me that maybe Nia will win because Nia got laid out on Raw this week, so maybe she gets the revenge at the pay-per-view. My feeling is Shayna, though. It just makes sense to continue that Becky Shayna thing. I don't think they're done with it. I think they just put it on pause after WrestleMania, and we're going to resume it here after Money in the Bank. It just makes sense. I could see them giving it to Nia, too, because they do like Nia. They do like giving things to Nia. I think Asuka is uh, kind of a long shot, but definitely nobody from SmackDown. I would be shocked if somebody from SmackDown won this thing. And really, I'm disappointed that the WWE spoiled it so much for us. Like, do they have to announce that Becky Lynch is going to be on Raw to confront the winner of the Money in the Bank? Because that tells us that somebody from Raw is going to win. Why couldn't they have just told us Becky Lynch will be on Raw? That's enough. Becky Lynch will make a statement uh, regarding her future on Raw. Like, you don't have to say she's going to confront the Money in the Bank winner because then it spoils the match for everybody because we all figure, well, Money in the Bank, it's going to be somebody from Raw here on the women's side. So if Dana or Lacey or Carmella try to do a false finish where they climb the ladder and they try to grab the briefcase, they're going to have to work real hard to get anybody to believe that they're going to actually win this match, right? You are not going to believe, no matter how hard they try, if Dana Brooke climbs the ladder, you're going to be like, come on, Dana, get out of here. We know you're not going to win. Where's Nia already? Let's go. Where's Shayna? It's too obvious. I don't know why WWE does this. They they seem to to do it with Shayna more than anything, right? They did it with the WrestleMania match with Shayna. Shayna attacks Becky Lynch, has his whole feud with Becky Lynch, then wrestles in the Elimination Chamber to get the match with Becky Lynch at WrestleMania. It seemed like they were destined to wrestle. There was no real point in having Shayna in that Elimination Chamber match. She was in it. She was obviously going to win. She obviously won and then went on to face Becky at Mania. I don't know why they like to spoil spoil their own pay-per-view main events. Like, it's, it's baffling. Why would they do this? Why would they spoil their own main events? I mean, they're not fully giving it away. But you know it's going to be somebody from Raw. So already you're taking 50% of the competitors in this match out of it. It's not good. It's not smart. I don't know what the thinking is. I don't like. I don't get the rationale behind it. Why? Well, 
like they just want a favorite in a certain direction. I mean, you were thinking someone from Rob was going to win anyways. So why not have that commercial? Because you already thought the top three competitors were from Raw. And there's no question that is the case. So kind of make that obvious anyways. Now, you know, if they didn't spoil it with saying Becky was going to confront the winner, I would have believed if Lacey started climbing that she might win and cash in on Bailey. I could have totally bought into that scenario. But now, nope. Come on. I've got Shayna winning this thing. So uh, I think somebody from Raw is going to win the women's match and somebody from SmackDown is going to win the men's match because that's usually how things go. Are you with me on Shayna and are you with me on a SmackDown man winning the men's match, which would be either Daniel Bryan, King Corbin, or Otis? What do you think? Well, that's kind of rough because I got AJ Styles winning Money in the Bank, so... If you're going with that logic, I would think a SmackDown woman would win then. Yeah, but that's not going to happen because they did the Becky thing. Or is the Becky thing just something to throw us off the scent? Is that possible? Could they be that smart? I just can't see AJ Styles not winning this. I mean, why did you put him in there? I mean, obviously to get the attention, but if you look at it going forward, he makes the most sense to win that match. Yeah. I don't disagree with that, Johnny, which now now you got me wondering. Because usually, don't they do, if they have two briefcases, one goes to Raw, one goes to SmackDown? Have they ever done two goes to the same brand? I feel like maybe they did. I'm not 100% sure. Like, uh, was it when Braun won? Because I think back then they had the whole like um, wild card rule, right? Or was that the year before that? But either way, I feel like it's been done. I mean, it's just out of necessity what they usually do. It, it has to be two from Raw, two from SmackDown. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you might be right. I don't know. When Braun won, it was the year 2018. Alexa Bliss won the women's match. I don't know who was on what show at the time, though. Who Who knows? Who oh, remembers? Yeah. Alexa was definitely on Raw, and I feel Braun was on Raw, too. Okay. You might be right. You might be right about that, John. Uh, and I'm going to say that you are because you usually are when it comes to this type of stuff. You have a better memory for the the minute details uh, than I do. So, okay. Maybe you're right because now, you know, my whole thought was, well, somebody from SmackDown has got to win because you got to give something to SmackDown if you're going to give the women's match to Raw, but now that I'm looking at these SmackDown competitors, like are you really going to give it to Daniel Bryan here? Have him chase Braun Strowman or, or Bray Wyatt? I don't know. King Corbin? I don't think so. It doesn't really make sense. Or does it? King Corbin, Braun Strowman, is that where we're going? I hope not. That, that wouldn't be that fun. I honestly think AJ is the best choice. And he really should win that match. I'd be disappointed if he doesn't win. And Otis? Could Otis win? Well, Otis can't even climb the ladder. You saw how SmackDown ended. Yeah, he couldn't climb the ladder. And I also saw Otis when uh, Baron Corbin tossed Daniel Bryan over the top rope. Otis didn't even catch him. Like, Otis was barely there. I'm sorry, Otis, but if you're a big body like that, and you're catching a guy like Daniel Bryan who's not that big, who's got injury problems, you know, in, in the past, who is a living legend and future Hall of Famer, and he's doing his best to put you over. When Otis was doing the, oh, yeah, Daniel Bryan was right there with him doing the, oh, yeah, making Otis look cool because you got a, a future Hall of Famer, a former champion, a main eventer of WrestleMania, a bona fide superstar doing your taunt with you, trying to get you over, and then you don't catch him. When Baron Corbin throws him off the top rope, come on now. You got to catch him. You got to catch a guy like Daniel Bryan, Otis. I was very disappointed. I like Otis. I want to like Otis. He's got a great personality. I love the way he looks. I love his face. I love his body. I love everything about him. He looks fantastic. He's got a legit amateur wrestling background. He's got cauliflower ears. 
He talks funny. He's got charisma. The guy is a superstar, but, but, he is super green, and he is very basic, and he's got to do better. He's got to add a little bit more to his arsenal as far as what he does in the ring, because what he does in the ring is very basic. I can see that they're trying to push him to the next level. They're trying to make him into more than just a tag team wrestler. They're trying to make him, you know, a star. On his own. But there are things that he's missing. And uh, I would totally forgive those things. Like, you know, a lack of real wrestling ability. He's not a great in-ring wrestler. There's not much there. Because he's young and he's inexperienced. But I do not forgive you not catching Daniel Bryan when that's your job. He's right there. It was not a hard catch. And he did not catch him. Bad job there from Otis. That's the kind of stuff, the basic stuff that you need to get down, especially if you're a big body like Otis and you're only catching Daniel Bryan. You're not catching like Roman Reigns or or Braun Strowman. You know, you're catching Daniel Bryan. Catch him. Johnny, you're in the ring all the time. Well, you used to be in the ring all the time before this whole pandemic thing hit, before, you know, back in the day when there were matches. You've, you've wrestled many matches. We know that you've been in locker rooms with... The Legion of Doom, the Road Warriors. You know, we talked about it. I was talking to you earlier today. You were dropping all sorts of names of wrestlers that you've shared locker rooms with. You're a big famous wrestler, John. Otis not catching Daniel Bryan. Am I am I being too harsh on him? Well, no, you're just calling him out for what happened. It's a mistake. But you also stated that he's inexperienced, so he hasn't been in these kind of situations before. So I'm kind of not surprised stuff like that's going to happen. It's unfortunate. You just you don't want to keep making those same mistakes. Some guys just aren't good at catching, and you just want to break those habits. It's hard to break that habit when you don't really practice that much, and it's kind of hard for them to practice, I bet, right now, when it seems like they have to wait outside before they can go outside to the ring. Yeah, and I'm sure he, you know, the lack of practice, lack of experience, whatever, but try harder, you know? Try harder, put your body in the way, catch Daniel Bryan. That's all I'm saying. It's Daniel Bryan. You know, it's not just anybody. It's Daniel Bryan. You got to make a real effort to catch him there if you're Otis and you're trying to move up the ladder of the WWE, right? If you're if you're trying to get there. And uh, hey, WWE, could 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 they stop you? I mean, they're going to stop now because the pay-per-views coming up. They're done TV, but man, were they running the the risk is worth the reward catchphrase into the ground or what? Like every person who cut a promo on Money in the Bank had to say the risk is worth the reward. Dana Brooks said it. Carmella said it. I think Alistair Black said it. Like everybody was saying it. And it was like, okay, okay. We understand Vince has told you to say the risk is worth the reward, pal. Say it. Say the risk is worth the reward. It is. But like, by God. When everybody is saying the same line in your promo, it really makes it seem uh, predetermined or uh, fake, you know? doesn't seem like it's really you saying these lines. It seems like it's just a script that you've been given that you are reciting. The risk is worth the reward. I will win WWE Money in the Bank. I will climb the corporate ladder of success. I will grab the brass ring. Yeah. Come on. Do better. Well, it's just in the delivery, right? I don't mind the line. I think it's going to go well with it. But it seems like they're going to have, like, attempted murder because I know you were <laughs> big on the whole, like, getting thrown off the roof thing. But that's probably going to happen, it seems like, because they they're hyping that like crazy, it seems like, on Raw. Yeah, it seems like there's going to be attempted murder at Money in the Bank. That's how they should advertise this thing. Attempted murder on pay-per-view, brother. Um, apparently, Vince did a big bump when they filmed this thing. Did you see that? There's a rumor that there's a gigantic bump that's going to happen. Somebody falls off a tower or something. And Vince, apparently, to show whoever took the bump that it was safe, did it himself. Which, he's like 73? And he doesn't look like he's in great shape. My goodness. Actually, he does look like he's in good shape. I mean, he's not, like, huge like he used to be, but he's still pretty good shape, though, for his age. 
I don't know. He didn't look like he was walking around that great a couple weeks ago when he was on SmackDown. Well, I've seen him where he's just wearing like a tight shirt. He still looks pretty good. All right. All right, John. Take it easy on your love here for Vince and his fantastic physique. All right. So you've got Shayna and AJ Styles winning the Money in the Bank ladder matches. And I hate to do this, but I think I have to agree with you. As much as I would uh, love... I know. As much as I would love to see my man Daniel Bryan win, and as much as I thought I had it all figured out with the Raw SmackDown theory, I'm looking at the SmackDown competitors here in this match. Corbin. Man, if Corbin wins, Corbin Strowman is going to be terrible. Otis. I just don't think he's ready. Daniel Bryan. I just don't think they're going to give it to Bryan. I could see Aleister Black winning, but I think AJ Styles makes a lot of sense. He's a heel. They've got a babyface champion on Raw. AJ's a legitimate threat. You could believe that AJ Styles would cash in and become champion at any time. I kind of want him to become champion. Like if AJ wins the Money in the Bank briefcase, don't you think he should be the next WWE champion? Eventually, like I don't think he'll cash in right away on Drew, but down the line, I could see maybe the end of SummerSlam could be something like that. Like AJ will be champion again. It should happen. He should be the one to finally out Drew, but I think they're going to give Drew a decent reign though. AJ Styles is our pick for the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Shayna Baszler is our pick for the women's. I guess we won't see any cash-ins because this match will be the main event, right? So after this match, the show will end. So no one will cash in their Money in the Bank briefcases at Money in the Bank this year. Well, it'd also be ridiculous because this is happening in Connecticut, right? That match and then the rest of the show is happening in Florida. So it just be kind of stupid. Like, it's not Bray Wyatt in this match where he can teleport. So, no, like, that shouldn't happen. Unless Bray Wyatt teleports himself after winning the WWE Universal title to Connecticut to face off against the Money in the Bank winner for some reason and then gets cashed in upon. Imagine that. That would be a really dumb move. Teleporting himself yeah. just to lose a belt. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Ridiculous. I can't even believe we're talking about teleportation. Braun Strowman is the WWE Universal Champion. Will he lose the title to Bray Wyatt? And I, I think it's going to be Bray Wyatt, not The Fiend, right? It's, it's being advertised as Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt was on SmackDown doing a promo with Braun Strowman. That promo was not very good. That was not the uh, highlight of SmackDown this week. Braun and Bray... Bray, not as strong as The Fiend. If this was The Fiend, I would think, oh, maybe maybe Braun's going to lose here. But, you know, it's Braun's first title defense. He just won the title, beat Goldberg at WrestleMania. He's going to beat Bray Wyatt here. He might not beat The Fiend down the road, but he's going to beat Bray here. Well, he'll walk away still the champion. I think that's definitely going to happen. How he wins is another question. Like, I could just see Bray vanish or whatever. And you just hear her laughing from The Fiend, and maybe that's how the match ends. But this definitely, I think, is going to continue. I think this is definitely probably going to get that three pay-per-view trilogy feud thing. Is this going to be a real wrestling match, or is this going to be a bunch of smoke and mirrors, gimmicks, and all sorts of stuff like the Firefly Funhouse match? I think this is going to be close to a wrestling match as it's going to get. I mean, you still might get some puppets here and there, but for the most part, wrestling. I think the that kind of shenanigans will be a lot later. And Braun retains? Yeah, I don't think he loses the championship right here. I, I'm not looking at any uh, titles changing hands at Money in the Bank. Doesn't look like it. We're going to get to the rest of the Money in the Bank card here. In just a little bit, we do have to take a short pause for the radio side. A little bit of a commercial break. When we come back, 
We'll get to the rest of the Money in the Bank card, and we'll also tell you about Double or Nothing from AEW. A lot of matches made official this week. A lot of big matches coming up on Dynamite on Wednesday. We'll recap this past week's episode of Dynamite as well. So much pro wrestling going on. It's a big weekend in the world of combat sports. Go to ringsidereport.net for more on everything that we do. Short pause here. We'll be right back. Yeah. We're still here. Point. You didn't catch what I said right there. It's too bad. What'd you say? I said, I don't think anyone's, there's gonna be, not going to be any title changes at Money at the Bank. Oh, Money at the Bank. That's what Matt Hardy used to call it. Correct. Money at the Bank. Mother at the Bank. Don't forget Mother's Day, okay? I know that this show on YouTube is going to premiere Saturday morning. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching live. The premiere Saturday morning. Don't forget to super chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to like this video. We appreciate it. We appreciate you guys watching in the chat. We appreciate everybody watching the show, whether live or later, whatever you do. We love it. Please join us for the uh, UFC 249 watch along coming up. And also join us for the WWE Money in the Bank watch along 7 p.m. on... Uh, on Sunday night, Johnny, I got a text from Fred during the show. That's wow. Fun. I got a text from Fred. This is crazy. You want to hear this? This is something. If, if I'm is, allowed to hear it, sure. Yeah, this is good. This is crazy. Now, apparently, I mean, this is not good, but this is some crazy news. It distracted me at the beginning of the show. I got this text from Fred, and I was like, what, what, what? I kind of wanted to start talking about it with you, but we got to talk wrestling. Jacare Souza was supposed uh -huh. to fight was supposed to fight Uriah Hall at UFC 249 on the opener of the TV prelims. Apparently, uh -oh. he test apparently he tested positive for COVID nineteen. Wow! Shit, that's no bueno, man. I wonder if the card is still going to happen now. Like, if one fighter tests positive. What does that mean for everybody else? What happens next? It's kind of rough that Dana UFC, was like hugging a bunch of people. UFC is still planning to do this card. Nothing has changed. The fight, obviously, the Jacare Uriah Hall fight is canceled, but the UFC is still planning on going forward with this event. Oh, wow. my God. Oh, my God. That's not good. That's not good at all. I always thought, but you know, if, if, somebody test, if somebody tested positive, they'd be like, all right, we're shutting it down. We're not doing this card. It's over. But somebody tests positive. Jock Array tests positive, and they're still doing this card. Oof. Uh, oh, my God. Oh, boy. But they're going to test them again, right? Like the day of? They need to. I don't know. At this point, you quarantine them. You get them the hell out of there, no? Hey, AEW is at the same hotel, okay? We got double or nothing in two weeks. Get Jacare the hell out of there. I need my double or nothing here. Cancel the UFC show. Send everybody home. Make sure AEW does weekly TV. UFC does a show, you know, once every couple of weeks. AEW is on my TV every week. I don't want Jacare and the UFC infiltrating Kenny Omega and giving him COVID-19. I don't need that in my life, okay? I need my dynamite. My God. Well, with AEW, they do test them every time, like the day before and then the day after. This is fucking terrible news. This could be devastating news. Shit. This could be really bad. God damn. Oh, this is not good. It's not good for the UFC. It's not good because... Uh, you know, this is what everybody was saying might happen, and uh, it would be really bad PR for the UFC if this happened, and uh, it happened. Now, if other fighters start testing positive off of this, it's going to be real bad. Oh, boy. I guess there's no word if Joe Rogan's still doing the show or not. Oh, Joe Rogan's not doing that show. Wow. I don't think Joe Rogan's going to Florida to do that. I don't think so. I don't know who's doing commentary at all. We'll find out on the pay-per-view, man. I have no idea. I don't think Rogan's doing it, though. Jeez, Jacare's got the COVID. Jacare's got the Ronas. 
My God. Well, I hope Jacare's all right, man. I wish him a speedy recovery. I mean, I don't know if he's even got symptoms. Probably not, right? If he doesn't even know. I mean, if he was preparing to fight, he was cutting weight, looking ready, good shape, probably didn't feel any symptoms, just tested positive. So Jacare's probably fine. I don't know, man. Well, I hope he's all right. I, I, I hope Jacare's all right. I Jeez. noticed at the weigh-in, wasn't he the first one at the weigh-ins too? And I feel like he was the only one wearing a mask and gloves. Yeah. That's even crazier. He took yeah. the most protection. And yet, wow, still positive. Oh, boy. <laughs> Jeez. I guess we'll find out what happens Saturday night. Hey, watch the UFC 249 watch along Saturday night on the YouTube channel right here with us if there is a UFC 249. Right? Like will be there, right? We'll well, we'll do like a show to tell you that there's no pay per view. I guess if there's no pay per view, right now there's still a pay per view, but things change real fast in this world, this new world that we live in. So who knows? Oh boy! Like you say, I I just hope this doesn't hurt the AEW because apparently they're all staying there for the whole month. So yeah. I I really hope uh, it doesn't hurt them. That is not good. Not good. Okay. Uh, let's tell you about something good, okay, Johnny? Let's let's switch gears, shall we? Okay. Let's tell you about our friends over at Stitcher. At the Ringside Report, we've been producing podcasts for about 15 years, and many of you have been streaming or downloading our shows, Wrestling Uncensored, Ringside Report MMA, on Stitcher. Now, Stitcher offering you the Ringside Report universe as part of their sponsorship of our work, a special offer on the premium version of their service. Besides all of our shows, you can listen to over 100,000 podcasts on your iPhone, Android, tablet, PC, Amazon Echo device, or in your car on demand, ad-free with Stitcher Premium. Stitcher Originals, bonus episodes, comedy albums, and more. Just $4.99 a month, $34.99 a year. It's a hell of a deal, and here's a better deal. You go to Stitcher.com slash premium, Stitcher.com slash premium, promo code RINGSIDE for a free month of Stitcher Premium right now. Stitcher.com slash premium, promo code RINGSIDE for a free month of Stitcher Premium. Doesn't get much better than that for you. Enjoy that. That's a gift for us. From us to you, all right? Here's another gift. IP Vanish. Go to vpn.ringsidereport.net. You need a VPN. You need to protect yourself on the internet. Do you want to get hacked? Of course you don't want to get hacked. You see that hacker guy on SmackDown? He could break up your tag team. You don't want that. You need a VPN. You need to sign up with IP Vanish. It's just $49 a year right now. It's a special offer. Now until, get this, the end of Sunday. So by the time Money in the Bank is over, from now until the end of Money in the Bank, it's a special weekend offer. It's a Money in the Bank weekend offer for you, a special offer on IP Vanish. Go to vpn.ringsidereport.net. New subscribers can get a year of IP Vanish for just $49 for the whole year. That's $4.16 a month. That is a tremendous deal. For IP Vanish, just for you, the Ringside Report Universe, you can save 65% off for a limited time. This deal will end Sunday night. VPN.ringsidereport.net. You can also get a 30 day money back guarantee by signing up to our link in the month of May. VPN.ringsidereport.net. Protect yourself on the internet with IP Vanish. Johnny's back. That was good. Good stuff. Oh, my goodness. All right, guys. What do we got next? Oh, no. There's a picture of... Oh, there's a picture of Dana White touching Jacare's hand. Oh, look at this. Hold on, hold on. I can't hear you. What? Oh, hold on. I lost your voice. Where's Johnny? Oh, my God. Johnny, what'd you say? What Wasn't Dana, like, hugging pretty much all the... Uh, all the people backstage too. Yeah. So that's really bad. Oh my god. This is bad. 
Uh, I don't know if this event is still going to happen. I don't oh, know. This is devastating. Wow. Well, that's the word. The word is Jacare has COVID-19. That's the latest. People are saying it's true. Some people are saying uh, they're not sure if it's true. But it seems like... It seems like it is. A lot of people are reporting it. By the time you see this, you'll know. But yeah, no, it's it's off. It's Jacare is... Uh, he tested positive for the COVID. jacare has got the Rona. Oh, okay, the, the fight is off as of right now, but the yeah. pay-per-view right now is still on. Pay-per-view is still on. Pay-per-view is still on. Please keep this pay-per-view together. Oh, my God, I hate this COVID thing. It really sucks. <laughs> it's so annoying. Pissing me off in so many different ways. God damn. All right, guys, let's get back to the action. All right? Don't forget your mother on Mother's Day. Don't forget, it's mother in the bank. Okay? Let's get back to money in the bank, shall we? Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Welcome back. It is Wrestling Uncensored. I am Dave Simon. He is Johnny North. RingsideReport.net is our website. Did you watch Dave and Johnny live this week? Did you see our recap of Dark Side of the Ring, the Herb Abrams story? We'll recap every episode of Dark Side of the Ring on Dave and Johnny Live. It's a YouTube exclusive show that you can catch right now at ringsidereport.net. Next week, we'll be doing the recap of the Road Warriors episode of Dark Side of the Ring. That should be a lot of fun. We'll be on YouTube Sunday night during Money in the Bank. Watch that show. A Money in the Bank watch along 7 p.m. Eastern. The whole entirety of WWE Money in the Bank, we will be there watching live with you. Now, we both have Braun Strowman retaining. Will Drew McIntyre retain his WWE Championship against the Monday Night Messiah, the man who wears one glove at all times, Seth Rollins? What's with the single leather glove? Like, I thought it was part of his wrestling attire, but then a couple weeks ago when they did that contract signing thing, Seth was wearing a suit, and he also wore the single leather glove. Is that part of his gimmick? It's not clear at all. It's terrible. I like to think it's a tribute to Kane, because Kane used to have the glove, right? I think of Michael Jackson when I see a single glove. I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason that uh, isn't really necessary. But no, it's just part of his attire. If it upsets you, I guess it's, it's working, right? Well, no, I mean, back it doesn't upset me. I just thought it was weird. I was like, okay, Seth as the Monday Night Messiah now, when he's wrestling, he wears one black leather glove. Okay, fine. Why? Eh, it's not clear. He's never explained it. it. It's the only change, really, in the Seth Rollins character as far as the look. It's the glove, right? But then when he wore a suit, he also wore the glove, which makes me think the glove is very important to this gimmick, and I don't understand why. It doesn't really make sense. Like, it's not been explained. Why is the glove so important to the Monday Night Messiah character? It's just weird. It's just weird. I don't think it's, you know, I'm not mad about it, but I'm just like... What's with the glove, dude? Whatever. He's not going to win the title, right? Drew just won. He beat Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. He's going to beat Seth. He might even beat AJ Styles when AJ tries to cash in on him. They're trying to push Drew. They're trying to solidify Drew as a top guy, as a WWE champion, as a top man on Raw. And uh, they're going to have him beat Seth Rollins to help solidify him as that guy. I don't buy into it. It's temporary. But it's what we're living through right now. Well, the big question is, will the match be good? I think they wrestle each other enough that it should be a decent match. Just sometimes in their matches, they do a little too much. So hopefully they just keep it simple. I don't have high expectations for this one. I really, um, no, not, not so much into this, John. Seth isn't going to win, though, right? No chance? Well, you never know, but no, I, I don't think he's going to win. I think Drew's going to win. 
Seth and uh, Drew had a little interaction. Drew came out on the winning end of it, though, hitting a headbutt on Seth Rollins at the end of Raw after beating Seth's uh, main man there, Buddy Murphy. Seth just watched from the stage, tried to attack Drew after, but ate a headbutt instead. Drew just going over strong on everybody. Well, they have to make him into a big main eventer, right? And he wasn't completely established. Helps beat names, but he's got to keep beating names. So he's just going to have to add Seth to that list. Speaking of beating names on Raw... Brendan Vink and Shane Thorne beat Ricochet and Cedric Alexander. What? I, I expected that was going to happen. Like, I'm not too surprised. Like, there was a reason they did that promo last week because they're building these guys up. So they're not jobbers. They're like a new tag team. We're supposed to take these guys seriously. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, you need new tag teams because I find like there's not really much on Raw or SmackDown. I mean, you have four corners tag match, but that's pretty much all you have on SmackDown. Raw, like, I guess with this team now, you pretty much have four teams. They need new teams. Yeah, I guess so. It's just when they were first presented on Raw, it was just like, here are two guys you've never heard of. They're a team now. They just felt like a job team. They didn't feel like a real team, and I was surprised that they actually got a win on Raw over a real team in Ricochet and Cedric, but I guess... You know, Ricochet and, and Cedric aren't pushed that strong in WWE. You know, they're around, but they're not. They're not going to be the champions anytime soon. The Viking Raiders might be. They beat the Street Profits in a non-title match. I thought the match was really solid. It was probably the best match on Raw. Was anything better? I, I enjoyed the gauntlet. But th this was good, too. It's just, it was all, it was no titles. So it's like, well, clearly the Viking Raiders are going to win and now get the title shot at the pay per view. So it was kind of a little too predictable. The gauntlet was a bit more fun because you didn't know who was in it. The uh, title shot at the pay per view is not official, by the way. We could throw that in our preview, but officially, according to the WWE, that match has not been made. So you think they throw it on? We only have six matches on this card. I figure they'll probably toss that one on, right? It's definitely, I think, going to make it. I mean, there's that and the the pre-show as well. They usually at least have at least one match for the kickoff. So I'd be very surprised if we don't see it on Sunday. Now, if we do see it, do, do the Viking Raiders take back the Raw Tag Team titles or do the Street Profits even up the series and get a win? Yeah, I think they even it up. But then they're even, right? So they have to wrestle each other again. So this yeah. will continue. Yeah, I can see the rubber match on Raw for the titles again. Um, okay, elsewhere at WWE Money in the Bank, Bailey defending the SmackDown women's title against Tamina. Bailey and Sasha losing to Tamina and Lacey on SmackDown. Tamina and Bailey wrestling there by themselves for a long chunk at the end of the match. Tamina hitting the super kick, followed by a Samoan drop to get the pinfall on Bailey. That was Tamina's win. She will not win on the pay-per-view, this seems pretty obvious. Yeah, I think so, but this will be very defining for Bailey if she can actually put out a good performance with Tamina, who, I mean, she's had okay moments at best, but can you remember a great match from Tamina? I, I don't think you can. So if Bailey can pull that off, this, I think, will go a long way in proving that she's one of the greatest champions. Because right now, Charlotte's kind of walking away with being the best women's champion in all of WWE. What about Becky? Becky's not even on the show. Like They say like Becky's going to show up, but that's about it. Becky's the man, and I heard uh, good reviews from her appearance on Billions this week, the TV show Billions. Becky is uh, starting an acting career, and apparently it's going quite well. So don't be surprised if uh, in a year from now, Becky Lynch isn't in the WWE at all. She might go the Batista Rock route. John Cena, you know? Becky Lynch might be crossing over. Well, it's bad timing for that, but good luck either way. But in WWE land, right now, Charlotte's the best thing going. All right. If you say so. Uh, I think Charlotte is uh, fantastic. That match with Liv Morgan on Raw, eh, not that great. 
that promo beforehand, even worse. That was terrible. Liv cannot talk. I, I mean, match, my goodness. But that match meant a lot, though, because remember Liv? She made that whole huge turn because of that, because of her loss to Charlotte. So this was kind of supposed to be her redemption. Yet she still lost, though. Yeah, pretty convincingly, too. Uh, I don't know what they were trying to do there. I don't know what they're trying to do at Liv Morgan, but apparently her gimmick is neither does she. She's not found herself yet. She doesn't know who she is, just like a lot of the young people out there, pal. What? My God. I hope we don't see Liv Morgan on this pay-per-view. We will see the New Day defending the SmackDown Tag Team titles against Miz and Morrison, the Forgotten Sons, and the Lucha House Party. My goodness, were the Lucha House Party and John Morrison impressive on SmackDown this week? Really good match, an eight-man tag. It was the Forgotten Sons, Miz and Morrison getting the win over the Lucha House Party and the New Day. Miz hitting his skull-crushing finale on Lince Dorado for the pinfall there. Really good match, really amazing stuff between Grand Metalik, Lince Dorado, and John Morrison. That was really good, and I thought Big E and Kofi had a really good performance as well. I like that match a lot. A lot of people complaining, saying, oh, I don't want to watch the WWE because there's no crowd. I don't need a crowd to enjoy a good wrestling match. I don't watch pro wrestling for the fans. I watch pro wrestling for the uh, pro wrestling. Isn't that a novel concept? And I thought we got some good pro wrestling from the WWE and AEW this week, and we didn't need a crowd. And I thought that eight-man tag was really good. And uh, Lucha House Party continued to impress. These guys are not only one of the best tag teams in the WWE, I'm starting to think they're one of the best tag teams in the world. No, they're really good. They've been underrated for a long time. I remember the Revival, I think, talked about them on Jericho's podcast, saying how they're really happy to wrestle them because they knew they could do good things with them. So it's great that they're finally getting the opportunity to be on pay-per-view. don't think they're going to win. I think New Day is going to win this one, but it's just going to be a good match where you can see some good wrestling. That's the problem, I think, with Raw and SmackDown. You get good moments here and there. It's just the shows are too long, and there's not a lot of good moments. A few weeks ago... Lucha House Party beat Miz and Morrison, and that was their big win, right? Surprising win. Forgotten Sons a couple weeks ago beat the New Day. That was a big win. Miz and Morrison, they won the eight-man tag. Miz got the win. This is New Day's time to win. New Day's been losing a lot. They lost in the eight-man tag. They lost to the Forgotten Sons. They're the tag team champions. This is where they pull one out. This is where they retain. They just won the titles like three weeks ago. Doesn't make a lot of sense for them to lose here. You're right, but it is New Day. We've seen them just lose the titles very quickly. because They seem more about just gaining more championships because they've already had the longest reign. So I think it's more about getting more championships overall. But I think you're right as well, where it's just it's too soon. They should at least have one successful defense. Yeah, and I think it's going to be here at the pay-per-view. I'm trying to come up with some other matches that we might see. How about Sheamus versus Jeff Hardy? I kind of figured we'd get that match. Sheamus and Jeff had a promo on SmackDown this week. Jeff just put a beatdown on Sheamus. I thought Sheamus would get a little bit of over. Jeff hitting the, the twist of fate there on Sheamus, and then he went to the top rope. I thought, okay, well, Jeff has been beating up Sheamus a lot. Sheamus is going to avoid getting swantoned here. He's going to roll out of the ring, and then we'll keep this thing going. But no, Jeff just goes up to the top, hits a swanton, hits his finisher on Sheamus, and just kind of stands tall at the end of the segment. I was a little bit surprised that Jeff came in and just got all his moves in on Sheamus. Uh, and I'm also surprised that he didn't announce that this match is going to happen at Money in the Bank. Will it? Or are we just going to wait till SmackDown next week? Well, I'd like to see it happen because we saw Mandy against Sonya, and I thought that was going to be safe for the pay-per-view. So maybe they'd like to save these TV matches for whatever reason, but I would have it for the pay-per-view. I think Jeff Hardy, his return to wrestling action, I think people would be very interested in seeing that, so I would do that. I wouldn't be surprised if Jeff actually loses too because Sheamus hasn't lost. Since he came back. And Jeff looked pretty strong on SmackDown, so I wouldn't be surprised if he uh, 
you know, lost in the next encounter with the WWE's 50-50 booking. They love to do that. You look good on one show, you're going to look bad on the next. That's just how they do things. Edge got the win at WrestleMania over Randy Orton. Uh, neither of them really look good there. Will they look good on Raw on Monday night? They are both advertised. Edge, Randy Orton, confrontation, something. Edge versus Randy Orton. Something's being advertised for Raw. Edge and Randy Orton. What does this mean? Is it a promo? Is it a rematch from WrestleMania? What are they going to do on Raw? I, I, I haven't got a read on this. I'm not sure. Just the way they're advertising it, it seems like it could be anything. Well, they said Edge is going to be hunting Randy Orton. So okay. I just have the idea that we're going to see a bunch of segments where Edge eventually in the end will get Randy in the ring and probably put a beat down on him and say, this isn't over. We're going to have another match. Probably won't have the match on Raw. Maybe it'll be a future Raw, but this isn't over. Why does Edge want to hunt Randy Orton? Didn't he put him away? Didn't he cry before he put him away at WrestleMania in that match? Like he hit a concerto on Randy, you know, kind of putting him out to pasture, you know, ending ending his career, it looked like, you know, the whole I'm sorry, I love you gimmick, starts crying, hits him with the chair, wins the match, and now he wants revenge for killing him at WrestleMania? What? Like, it doesn't even make sense. He seems sad that he had to put him away at Mania, and now he's going to be hunting Randy. It just makes Edge seem like a bit of a jerk. You're trying to make sense in WWE. That's uh, it's a hard thing to do. I uh, think you're losing that battle. I, I think it's just they need to have these guys back on Raw. They don't have much of a reason, and it's just, well, they don't like each other, so they're going to face each other in some capacity. Yeah. Okay, John, fine. Excuse me for wanting my TV shows to make sense and be logical. I watch a lot of uh, other TV shows that seem to make sense. The characters' motivations aren't, uh, you know, nonsensical. And also, you know, a lot of the TV shows I watch, very rarely do the uh, same characters in their monologues repeat the same catchphrase like, the risk is worth the reward. Never seen that in another TV show. Weird. Let's stop talking about the WWE and go to AEW, okay? Because uh, we're done with Money in the Bank. Let's go to AEW and what's happening there. Cody Rhodes beat Joey Janela in the opener after a crossroads on Dynamite this week. What would you think of that one? That was an okay opener. I mean, Janela hasn't really been doing anything, so I didn't expect him to beat Cody, but... It was an all right match. I just liked that there was more energy. Like, just more people around. It, it just felt like new life in AEW again. Yeah, they don't just have uh, people ringside. They had people in the stands. They're at that place there, that arena, the little... I guess it's like a concert venue type deal in uh, Jacksonville. It's attached to the football stadium. And they had uh, a bunch of people in the crowd. You know, not like a crowd, but they had... You know, looked like some friends and family and different wrestlers. And, you know, it wasn't just Pineapple Pete and Colt Cabana. So Cody and Joey Janela, you know, I thought it was all right. I didn't, uh, I wasn't uh, blown away by that match. I wasn't blown away by Nyla Rose squashing Kenzie Page. I wasn't blown away by John Moxley and Frankie Kazarian. I thought it was okay. Moxley beat Kazarian after the Paradigm Shift DDT. I didn't think it was the best match on the show. What did you think of that, the Moxley match? I thought it was all right. It just felt more like a feeling out process because I don't think they've ever wrestled each other. So I think it was just getting used to each other and it's kind of slow at times, but I thought it was all right. Just, the problem is there wasn't a lot of face versus heels until we got to the main event. So it just felt like it was hard for people really to get into it because they're kind of cheering for both sides pretty much the whole time. But I, that's going to change later on, I'm sure, as the shows go on. I don't know, man. John Moxley, Jake Hager, John Moxley, Frankie Kazarian. I haven't been too impressed with John Moxley since winning the AEW title. His matches have not been that great. 
I, I don't think his matches have been that great, even when he was like going up for the title. It was just he was so over, they kind of didn't have a choice. Plus, Jericho was leaving, so it was really just convenient that Moxie was coming up. He hasn't been pinned yet in AEW, so it just kind of makes sense that he's going to be the champion because they pushed him as a top guy. I feel like he's lost the fire to a certain extent. When John Moxley was first gone from the WWE, when he was going to New Japan and having those hard-hitting matches, it felt like he was unleashed and there was a real fire in his belly. Now, it seems like, you know, he's made some money, he's on top, he's a world champion, and he's just kind of coasting again. Feels like I'm watching Dean Ambrose. Well, it's not as bad as that WWE championship reign that he had. That, that was really rough to watch. But problem is here, he doesn't have a lot of people to go up against right now. He has no rivalries. And they're starting to try to build something with Brody Lee for the pay-per-view. But it's tough, too, because he just came in as well. Brody Lee just showed up. He attacks John Moxley. And now it's going to be Brody Lee challenging John Moxley for the AEW championship at double or nothing in two weeks. Brody Lee just showed up. What has he done since arriving in AEW to merit a title shot? Who has he beat? Marco Stunt. Right. So this is a guy who's come into AEW as the leader of the Dark Order, had a couple good promos, had a fun match with Marco Stunt, but hasn't really beat anyone, hasn't had a number one contenders match. For some reason, he gets the title shot at AEW just because he and his Dark Order crew beat up John Moxley. But I think your average wrestling fan looks at this, a WWE fan looks at this and says, Luke Harper and Dean Ambrose are main eventing a pay-per-view? This is some real B-level stuff. And that's what AEW is looking like right now when you put on a main event for a world championship like that. It looks like a B-level WWE. When you're putting Dean Ambrose and Luke Harper in your main event, that's a B-level WWE product. That's not why I watch AEW. I'm not watching AEW for John Moxley and Luke Harper matches. I'm watching AEW for Kenny Omega, for the Young Bucks, for Cody Rhodes, for Darby Allin. Yes, even for Orange Cassidy. I'm watching AEW for Dustin Rhodes. I'm watching AEW for MJF. I'm watching AEW for Lance Archer. I am not watching AEW for John Moxley and Brody Lee. I've liked what I've seen from Brody Lee so far, but not to the extent that I believe in him to be the next world champion of AEW. I don't believe that he's been built strong enough that he's actually going to beat John Moxley here in only his second defense. And I don't think that he really deserves to be in this match or deserves to be the world champion of AEW right now. And quite frankly, neither does John Moxley. I could think of a bunch of guys, a handful of guys in AEW right now that would make much better world champions for that company. Kenny Omega, Cody Rhodes, Hangman Page, Darby Allen, MJF, Lance Archer. There are guys there that don't have the WWE mid-card stink on them. And that's what it is. It's that mid-card stink. And Brody Lee has not been in AEW long enough to get that stink off of him. He has not been on TV long enough as a different character, not been built up as a legitimate threat long enough to get that stink of Luke Harper off of him. And now AEW's going with it. It's the wrong move. I'm disappointed. Give the belt back to Jericho. Right the ship. Because they're going down the wrong direction. It feels like one of these wrestling companies taking WWE mid-carters and making them main eventers. And that doesn't work. Doesn't work. People watch AEW for new stars. For new, different, different. When you give us Moxley and Harper or Moxley and Lee or whatever in your main event for your world title, it's not different. 
It's exactly what we got from the WWE. And people are tur turning to AEW for an alternative. Give us an alternative. Well, you're saying that's the main event. Uh, I don't think that's like signed, sealed, delivered. Yes, it's the title match, but I, I feel Cody and Archer, that's been pushed much more. And if you think about it, that's for the first ever TNT championship. I can see that actually main event. There's a lot more put to that match than Lee and uh, Moxley. What's a more important title, the Intercontinental title or the WWE Championship? Depends what we're talking about sometimes. No. SummerSlam. I remember Come on. Bret Hart no. and Bret Hart made a No. No. Johnny North, just answer a straight question. Come on. It's very simple. You know what the pecking order is. Who's who's beating Brock Lesnar? Drew McIntyre, WWE champion, or Sami Zayn, Intercontinental champion? Come on. Let's be real. The TNT title is a mid-card championship. Sure, the Cody Lance Archer match is more compelling. Because both wrestlers are more compelling. Cody's been gone from the WWE long enough. He doesn't have that mid-card stink on him. When you think Cody Rhodes, you think the elite, the Bullet Club, Cody, the American Nightmare, Brandy, the whole deal, AEW. That's what you think of when you think Cody Rhodes. When you see Brody Lee, you still think of Luke Harper. When you see John Moxley, most people still think of The Shield. They haven't been gone long enough to get that stink off of them. Lance Archer, no one even remembers he was in the WWE, right? He was there for a cup of coffee. Doesn't matter. He comes in. He's a new performer. He's fresh. He's new. He's been in Japan. He's come in now. He's got Jake the Snake with him. It's a new package. It's interesting. The John Moxley thing, it's like a, it's like a Dean Ambrose 2.0. And the Luke Harper thing, the Brody Lee deal, I mean, it's basically a continuation of a uh, Wyatt family. Just uh, with a hint of Vince McMahon thrown in there. And that gimmick is wearing thin pretty quick. You notice the first couple weeks he had some material, and now it's like you call him Mr. Luke Harper or Mr. Brody Lee or whatever. Oh, Mr. Oh, I get it. I get it. Cool. There's not much there. There's not a lot of meat on that bone. And this is what we're discovering with AEW. Some of these guys are very creative. Some of these guys needed to get the shackles taken off of them by the WWE or by whoever so you could really see what they can do. But some of these guys, when the shackles are taken off, you get to see their creativity. Eh, it's not so good. I don't know if you've seen all that uh, Luchasaurus stuff on being the elite, him looking for his tail. It's not so good. Sometimes you give the guys the creative freedom and they will deliver. The bubbly bunch, I thought was pretty good. You know, there, there are certain things you could do, but then other times you give them the creative freedom and uh, they run wild with it and it turns out uh, kind of bad. I feel like this Brody Lee thing is uh, running out of steam pretty quick. And maybe that's why they, they realize it's running out of steam. So they're like, all right, well, this is as big as he's going to get for our company. This is as high profile as he's ever going to be. So let's give him a title match now. Let's use him up for a title match now because it's only downhill from here. What do you think about the quality of the promos? I think they're getting worse. Well, the promo, I like that when he threw the mic down, it was right at Moxley's like face. That was like perfectly done. I think that was probably an accident, but wow, that was so well done. And Moxley, like, fighting back against uh, the Dark Order, like, it makes him seem like he's got he's the underdog in this whole situation. And there's not much they can do, unfortunately. There's not other challengers. Like, you don't have Hangman. You don't have the Young Bucks, unfortunately. It's everyone who's stuck in Florida right now. That's who they're pretty much going with for the pay-per-view. So they don't have other challengers. You know, they don't have yeah. Pac. Pac would be excellent with Moxley. Yeah. But they don't this have this should be Pac's spot right now. This should be Pac and Moxley at double or nothing, right? That should be the match. But Pac's not around, so they're throwing Brody Lee in there. I mean, it's not totally their fault. They are working with a depleted roster, but uh, I'm not too uh, I'm not too impressed with it. 
Also, MJF makes everybody else look bad as far as promos. His promos are so good. He's great. Oh, he's already got a match, though, too. So, I mean, they're slowly yeah. building him up. So, it's kind of unfortunate, but he kind of got killed on his push a bit where he wasn't being shown at all because of COVID. And now they kind of have to rebuild him again. I, I think eventually he'll face Moxley. It's just they got to give it time. MJF will be in action on Dynamite on Wednesday, and he will be taking on Jungle Boy at Double or Nothing for some reason. Uh, John Moxley, Brody Lee, official for Double or Nothing. We also have some big matches coming up on Dynamite this week. Brody Lee will wrestle Christopher Daniels. Jurassic Express, that'll be Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus with Marco Stunt in their corner. We'll take on the best friends with Orange Cassidy in their corner. Don't really understand why they're doing this. Two babyface tag teams against each other. Why? Why would the Jungle Express take on the best friends? What's the beef there? I don't really understand. They don't really have a lot of their tag teams, unfortunately. Okay. Hikaru Shida will take on Britt Baker, Penelope Ford, and Chris Statlander in a fatal four-way with the winner probably getting the next shot at Nyla Rose for the AEW women's title at double or nothing. I'd go with Hikaru Shida to get the win there because I think Nyla's already beat Statlander and Britt and Penelope are two heels and Nyla's a heel, so Hikaru Shida? Well, I mean, just Sheeta on her record alone, even if she lost this match, she still has a better record than everybody there. So it definitely should be Sheeta. Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy will try again as a tag team taking on proud and powerful Santana and Ortiz. I think they'll probably be successful this week taking on Santana and Ortiz. It's not the powerful sex gods tag team, Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara. Kenny and Matt Hardy losing. Matt Hardy losing in his AEW debut. A little bit surprising. In a false count anywhere match. Jake Hager, proud and powerful, helping out Jericho and Sammy Guevara. It was really a five-on-two match. No elite to help out Kenny and Matt. They were really in on their own. They were outnumbered. And uh, they wind up losing. Kenny Omega with an incredible moonsault off a thing. Cherry picker. Unbelievable. The height of that moonsault was crazy. Spot of the week. That It's tough. I mean, there was that, and when uh, Sammy got run over, too, with the golf cart. Yeah. I see that all the time on Twitter now. Uh, that's an incredible meme right now. Sammy really took that golf cart really, uh, really well. His golf cart, him getting run over by the golf cart, was just as good as his... Uh, Trash can shot was bad. Did you see him hit? I think it was Matt Hardy with the trash can. It was the weakest trash can shot you have. Oh, no, he hit Kenny Omega. It was the weakest trash can shot I've ever seen in my life. That was awful. Come on, Sammy. Hit him harder. Yeah, it's okay. They'll hit him hard with the golf cart. I mean, that's definitely what happened. So it's all right. I mean, he'll learn. Kenny looked like he pegged Jericho right in the head with the trash can shot at one point, too. Do you see that? It looks like you hit him with the hard part, too. I mean, yeah. when you hit him with the bottom end like that, that's rough. Jericho kind of made a sound, too, like, yeah, you know, like one of those, like, ah, you really hurt me there. That was cool. I like that. Uh, I thought the match was all right. Um, Matt Hardy with the wardrobe changes, though, three wardrobe changes or two, I guess. But, you know, he comes out in one set of gear, and then he, he left, and then he came back out in the old Hardy Boys gear, and then he came back later on out of the ice machine, and he had new gear on, like, the costume changes, it, it just, it made it goofier than it needed to be. You know, it felt like a good, violent street fight type of deal, but then the Matt Hardy stuff was kind of like, yeah, all right, I don't know, it seemed unnecessary, and Matt Hardy had a real hard time getting that golf cart started. That's live television for you. <laughs> yeah. It, it helped with the when they're taped next week, it won't be so bad. They probably should have done it then. But we kind of needed the wardrobe changing because he didn't do anything else besides that. There was no other broken elements to the match. So that was his kind of thing for, the, for his gimmick. I suppose. Um, but it was just, I don't know, it seemed out of place. 
I thought the match was all right, though. It was fun. It was a nice little main event to, to end Dynamite. I liked it. And I'm very excited for the dream match six weeks in the making. Chris Jericho, Le Champion, will take on, finally, this Wednesday on Dynamite, Pineapple Pete, the dreaded Pineapple Pete, the guy that Jericho has been picking on on commentary the past four weeks. He will finally step into the ring with Pineapple Pete. Le Champion, Chris Jericho versus Pineapple Pete in what should be a squash match. Three minutes and under, Pineapple Pete will not get more than one move on offense. This will be great. I cannot wait for Jericho versus Pineapple Pete. I've been waiting for this. I can't believe they're actually doing it. Jericho and Pete. I was much more excited for Jake showing up with his snake and putting on Brandy. That was, that was much more exciting than hearing this news about Jericho. Just that a squash was, match. I mean, That was some creepy stuff there. Uh, Lance Archer beating QT Marshall. Brandy Rhodes was in QT's corner. And then Britt Baker hit Brandy with a DDT. And then Britt rolls Brandy into the ring to allow Jake the Snake Roberts to come into the ring, put his snake all over Brandy, and he even like got on a, got on his like uh, a push up position on top of Brandy, and he like mounted her like a full mount position. It was like really creepy how Jake was like not only putting his snake all over Brandy, but also kind of putting himself all over Brandy, like. Man, Jake the Snake is really good at being creepy, and he did it again this week on Dynamite. By God, that's what they pay him for. It worked. And that's where that Cody against Archer match, it's exciting. I mean, not only do you have two good wrestlers, but all the other extra added to that match. You have Brandy, you have Jake, probably Arn Anderson as well. To, to me, that's the main match you're looking forward to at the pay-per-view. I agree 100%. What's Kenny's match going to be? That's a great question. I, I feel it's probably going to be something with Matt, some sort of like elite deletion. They were talking about that before. So I can see that going down. Maybe with Jericho involved too? And Sammy Guevara do some sort of rematch deal? Whatever they can pull off at this point. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's all the inner circle against them in some capacity. All right, well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Double or nothing coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Johnny North, we are overtime here on the show. We will be back for Money in the Bank coming up. 7 p.m. Eastern time, Sunday night for WWE Money in the Bank. Check us out live. Watch along, ringsidereport.net. Go to the front page. The video will be right there. Click on the link. Press play on the YouTube video, and you'll be able to watch Money in the Bank with us. In the meantime, check out Johnny North at North Genesis on Twitter at Genesis Johnny North on Instagram. You can check me out on all the things at Dave Simon MMA. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and leave a comment. Don't forget when you subscribe, click the bell so you get notifications every time we are on. If you're listening to this on the radio, you can always watch us on Facebook Live or on YouTube. All the info is on our website, ringsidereport.net. For Johnny North, I am Dave Simon. Catch us for WWE Money in the Bank and the UFC 249 watch-alongs this weekend. Big weekend at ringsidereport.net and the Ringside Report universe. For Johnny North, I am Dave Simon, and this has been Wrestling Uncensored. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.